I'm Kat Oriel with Forbes Breaking News. Today, I'm here with the Rep. Kevin Kiley of California. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me today. And first, before I begin my questions, I have to congratulate you on your wedding just a few days ago. Um, congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, it was uh, uh, quite a way to end 2023. Yeah, I bet. And I must ask, how do you plan a wedding as a freshman rep in Congress? <laughs> well, I w had the very good fortune to have a uh, fiance, now wife, uh, who uh, uh, was uh, really extraordinary. And we had a lot of help from uh, from friends and family uh, in pulling it all together. And uh, we kind of planned it for the very last or second to last day of the year, because figured that was the time when it was, uh, you know, most likely we could be sure we wouldn't have to be pulled back to D.C. for votes or something like that. So uh, fortunately, it uh, it all went off uh, very smoothly. It was a beautiful uh, ceremony, a uh, wonderful day with, with friends and family, and uh, I couldn't be happier. <laughs> so glad to hear that. And even though I'd love to talk about more about your wedding all day, we're here to talk about former Harvard President Claudine Gay's resignation just yesterday. And so in another interview I saw that you did yesterday, you said, this is the right thing for Harvard, but more importantly, it's the right thing for higher education in this country. So why is Dr. Gay's resignation the right thing for higher education in this country? Well, you know, we've seen Harvard uh, throughout its history, actually, has sort of, uh, you know, for better or for worse, and I think often for better, uh, you know, led uh, American higher education and, and set the tone uh, in many ways. And this has been true since it was America's first college. Uh, and it's been true for uh, almost four centuries now. Uh, but, you know, in recent years, uh, it has led uh, the country and led higher education uh, in a very negative way. And that when that and that's, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, many of the problems that ail higher education uh, right now at our institutions of higher learning, they, they cost too much. They deliver too little value uh, for graduates. They're not preparing uh, young people for participation uh, in modern society and for citizenship. Uh, and they've become some of the most intolerant places in American life uh, with a complete lack of viewpoint diversity uh, with severe limits on freedom of speech. Uh, and as we've seen to a horrifying degree in recent months, uh, now they've led this 21st century resurgence of one of the world's most ancient and retrograde prejudices, that is anti-Semitism. And Harvard was really the worst on all of these fronts. Harvard had the very worst record, for example, on freedom of speech of the hundreds of colleges uh, that were ranked. In fact, the worst rating in the history of the survey. And then Harvard was perhaps the worst university, uh, even before the events of October 7th, frankly, but especially afterwards, uh, in terms uh, of allowing a hostile environment uh, where to the point where, uh, you know, the president of Harvard, when I asked her at our hearing uh, in Congress, could not even say, uh, refused to say, if a Jewish student could feel safe and welcome on that campus. And so I think the fact that you have now, uh, you know, this reached a point where Harvard itself uh, felt the need uh, to uh, force out their president following Penn doing the same thing, uh, that really is a potential turning point in the trajectory of higher education uh, in this country, uh, where, you know, Harvard has recognized the need uh, for fundamental cultural change. And I think that that can reverberate across the landscape uh, of our uh, colleges uh, and universities so that they can return to being centers of intellectual life and national assets and leading lights for our country, rather than the sort of huge liabilities that they've in many cases become. Because, you know, what we've seen is that when it comes to suppressing free speech, when it comes to anti-Semitism itself, is things that start at universities then sort of escape the confines of campus life and, uh, you know, affect and impact uh, our broader culture. And so I think that, you know, as horrifying as what we have seen uh, happen on these campuses is, this is a moment of reckoning and an opportunity uh, to return to principles of protecting free speech, of institutional neutrality, uh, of academic freedom, of uh, moving beyond this, this DEI paradigm that has really corrupted uh, what a university is supposed to be about and return to excellence as the foundation uh, of academia in America. Well, you're a Harvard alum yourself. And so I'm curious about when you talk about a return and your reflection to your time there compared to now, when do you feel like the shift was? Do you think Harvard would have handled its response to the aftermath of an event like October 7 better or worse 20 years ago when you were an undergrad there? When was that shift, you think, at Harvard? 
You know, that's a really good question. I uh, When I was an undergraduate, things were not nearly as bad as they are now, but there were still some signs of it uh, where you saw, you know, uh, some of the uh, some hints of, uh, of what we're, we're now seeing. But I think that, you know, over the course of the last, uh, you know, maybe decade or so, I think you've really seen uh, these trends uh, reach, uh, you know, an all time low. Uh, and uh, I think that there are many reasons for it. But I mean, we've been raising alarms about this uh, for a long time now. I actually uh, wrote a resolution uh, at the beginning of this year uh, that was condemning anti-Semitism on college campuses and having the U.S. Uh, House take a strong stand against that because we were seeing, uh, for example, in California, student groups putting into their bylaws saying that we are not going to allow a speaker to come and talk on any topic uh, if they have favorable views uh, towards Israel. And so we've seen this building uh, for quite a while now, and but it was really, you know, after the events of October 7th, uh, that things, uh, you know, just reached a, a shocking, uh, you know, a degree of, of, of intolerance and, uh, you know, things that we would never expect really to see uh, in this country, frankly, where you have students being bullied, students being harassed, classes being shut down, Jewish students uh, afraid to even uh, leave their dorms. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it was universities like Harvard and like Penn, uh, where things were the very worst. So the fact that now we have uh, the presidents of those universities have now lost their job. That is a much needed dose of accountability, but we need to make sure that we need to understand that it wasn't just these two people, these two particular university presidents that were responsible. They did a, you know, they certainly were responsible for uh, making things a lot worse, uh, especially in the last few months. Uh, but this is a whole culture that is built up in our universities. And what we need right now is fundamental cultural change. If you were the one who was responsible for making the decisions now at Harvard or at an institution of higher education, what would you say you would need to do to be able to look parents in the eye and tell them that Jewish students and all students feel safe here on the campus? Well, I think that it's going to take, uh, you know, a real, uh, some real self-reflection uh, on the part of the university uh, to look at how did we allow ourselves to become an environment where such a retrograde uh, prejudice could really uh, take root uh, and then, you know, uh, reveal itself sort of in such a, uh, a shocking way, uh, following one of the most horrifying events we've seen in modern times, the attack of October 7th. And so I think that, you know, the, uh, the removal of the university president is a very good start because now the university could say, we recognize that this is a person who did not take the safety uh, of Jewish students on our campus with the degree of seriousness that was needed, who wouldn't even answer a question about it in a straightforward way in a congressional hearing. Uh, but, you know, I think that beyond that, uh, the university really needs to, uh, you know, come out and uh, and acknowledge uh, the forces of anti-Semitism on their campus uh, that have, uh, you know, been allowed to, uh, to have essentially been nurtured in many ways uh, by the university's own policies. Uh, there needs to be an acknowledgement of, uh, of what has led to this and then uh, a path forward for how uh, things can change. I think that at Penn, they actually uh, did put out a statement, a group of professors following the removal of the president there of how we can return, how, how that university can really return uh, to the guiding principles uh, of what a university should be about by restoring principles like freedom of speech, uh, like academic neutral, uh, freedom, like institutional uh, neutrality. Uh, and when you have those bedrock principles, uh, that are adhered to, then you don't have situations like we had with, with Harvard and Penn, where these are the very worst universities in the country for protecting free speech, but then suddenly they purport to be uh, champions of free speech in order to, uh, you know, uh, allow anti-Semitism to fester uh, on their campuses in order to, uh, you know, not have any responsibility for stopping students from being bullied or stopping classes from being shut down. It was that double standard uh, that just utter hypocrisy uh, that I believe really sent a signal to the forces of anti-Semitism on those campuses that then reverberated across the landscape of higher education and infected our broader culture. Uh, so if we can return to having, you know, um, uh, clear standards uh, around these issues of, of freedom of speech, that all that what the standards are in accordance with the First Amendment, that speech will be uh, protected, whatever the content of it might be, uh, but then also have clear standards for when that crosses the line into bullying and harassment, which is not protected by the First Amendment, or to have standards of institutional neutrality. This was the other issue. 
is that President Gay refused initially to come out and condemn and clear language the attacks of October 7th, uh, which spoke volumes when the university had made very clear statements about other past uh, political controversies. And so it's that double standard uh, that really, I think, has propelled uh, the crisis of anti-Semitism on campuses. And so if we can remove that double standard and return to clear principles uh, of, uh, of academic freedom, institutional neutrality, protecting freedom of speech, and a focus on excellence as the guiding principle uh, of our universities, then I think that's the way that we uh, get things moving in the right direction. And then what about students before they enter? Um, into the universities. What are your thoughts on how schools should be addressing a post-affirmative action admissions process and how that all relates to what we've been talking about as it relates to diversity? Well, universities have an obligation to comply with the law. And so, uh, you know, to the standards that have been set forth by the Supreme Court, um, you know, universities need to uh, adhere to those. And I don't think it uh, serves anyone uh, well uh, to try to find ways uh, to evade them. I mean, this is, uh, we are a, a country of laws. And I think that if you look at California, uh, we've actually in our constitution of the state as a, by a voter initiative, uh, had uh, a non-discrimination uh, in college admissions principle uh, in our constitution for decades. There was an attempt to uh, undo that in 2020 and it failed overwhelmingly. You know, California is not a red state, right? This is a uh, uh, one of the most liberal uh, electorates in the country, at least by election results. Uh, and yet in California, uh, the voters overwhelmingly uh, voted in the election uh, to keep a principle of non-discrimination uh, in our constitution. And so I think that is all part and parcel of returning to a paradigm uh, of excellence and uh, frankly, uh, you know, upending this corrupted DEI, uh, you know, uh, bureaucracy that is uh, kind of behind many of the, the more problematic elements of campus life these days. Would you be supportive of greater congressional oversight of college campuses and college presidents because of what the hearing on anti-Semitism last month dug up and exposed? Absolutely. I think it's it's vitally important. Uh, you know, we have, uh, as the Education Workforce Committee, which I'm a part of, uh, already begun uh, a broader uh, investigation and oversight. We're looking at how different campuses uh, have been handling these issues. Um, and uh, But, you know, we need to understand that this is an investment that American taxpayers are being asked to make because uh, even private institutions like Penn and Harvard receive massive amounts of federal funding. And so if the federal government is subsidizing institutions uh, that are then using uh, their resources and their influence to, uh, you know, uh, fan the flames uh, of prejudice uh, and, uh, and harassment on their campuses, that is a huge, huge problem. But in a broader sense, I think we need to ask fundamental questions about the value proposition of the modern academy and uh, whether, you know, what what that investment, that massive investment of American taxpayers uh, is, is leading to in terms of the, the return we're getting on it. Uh, and so I think that this is a moment where we really need to reflect on uh, the nature of the modern university, uh, what has become of it, how well suited it is for the demands of the modern world, uh, and how we can rethink, uh, you know, the uh, the the basics of, of a university education to assure that if we are giving large amounts of taxpayer funds, uh, that it's in service of educating the next generation in a way uh, that is going to be, uh, you know, uh, a good thing and lead to good, uh, you know, uh, results for our country. Two questions off of that. Have in your research into how schools are handling this, is there a particular example of a school that you are like, this is a good example, every other school should follow in their footsteps? And then going off of that, voters do have a stake in this, and we're entering 2024 an election year. So, how important is education and the culture war and you know the handling of anti Semitism and all the other topics we talked about? How is that going to be important in the year that we're um, facing? Yeah, well, uh, University of Chicago has sort of been the gold standard for, uh, you know, protecting uh, freedom of speech and uh, and related uh, matters on campus. I actually, when I was a state legislator, sponsored a resolution in the California legislature citing, in fact, reprinting uh, the University of Chicago statement on free expression uh, as a standard for our universities. That passed our legislature unanimously, uh, by the way, back in, in 2017. And so I think that's uh, the standard that many would 
uh, would point to. Um, but uh, I think that also, you know, we can look back at even an institution like Harvard in, in past eras, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, led the way in higher education and in, in sort of the, the modern version of a liberal arts education. And so in some sense, uh, you know, it's just about returning uh, to founding principles. Now, as far as <clears throat> the political um, elements of this go, um, I think that absolutely it's something that uh, that is on voters' minds is not only what's happening in our universities, but what's happening throughout uh, K through 12. Uh, we saw in you know Virginia uh, when Glenn Youngkin was elected, a wave election there that was really um, you know based primarily uh, on issues of education. I think that folks saw during the whole COVID era, the COVID shutdowns, the school shutdowns that have robbed so many young people uh, of, uh, of so many opportunities and, and led to harms that are going to be with us to generations to come. Uh, many parents saw there how thoroughly corrupted uh, our educational institutions uh, have become. And so I think that absolutely, and I'm a former high school teacher, I've been on the education committee now in the House of Representatives, I was the vice chair of the education committee in the California State Assembly. So it's an issue that I am uh, you know, focused on first and foremost. Uh, and I think that there is a great uh, amount of, of dissatisfaction uh, with what's happening at, at throughout the entire K-12 through higher education uh, landscape in this country. And so I think that some of the issues that we've been talking about, you know, returning to principles of excellence, having high standards of academic rigor, um, these are things that apply not just to higher education, uh, but for all students. And I think that, you know, uh, we've seen <clears throat> in the last few years, a parent's movement really emerge. And I think that's something that's only going to continue to grow. My final question for you, I do want to talk about some other current events of the day. We're facing an upcoming budget battle in Congress. Where do you see that going? Well, you know, we have uh, had, I think, some real progress made in the appropriations process. We've passed a number of them uh, out of the bills out of the House uh, that have <clears throat> contained significant uh, and responsible uh, spending reductions. Uh, we passed the, uh, the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act last year, uh, which is a bipartisan bill signed by uh, you know, the president uh, that said for the first time in, in a long while, in modern times really, that we're gonna spend less money this year uh, than we did the year before. And so uh, I'm hopeful that uh, you know, when we return, we'll be able to wrap up the process uh, in a way that is consistent uh, with with those principles that we need to, uh, you know, cut spending in order to uh, start to get a hold of this utterly unsustainable debt situation that we have, uh, while at the same time assuring that we're providing for our military, our veterans, protecting Social Security uh, and Medicare. And so, um, you know, I think that with the bills we've passed so far, uh, we have, uh, you know, and some of them don't go uh, as far as many of us might like, uh, but at least I think they've been a step in the right direction. And I think that if we can finish the budget process in a way that adheres to those principles of limiting spending, changing the trajectory of spending, which has continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. And if we can draw a line in the sand and say no more growth, we're going to move in another direction. And that is uh, going to be provide some real hope uh, that we can get the debt situation under control going forward. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me today and congrats again on your wedding. <laughs> thank you so much. You bet. Anytime.